Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Alex Ang, co-president of APAC here at Iowa State University. Um, tonight we have our lecture for the whole our program of uh, the Asian Heritage Celebration for this whole month of April. And this man, he works in the media, working with newspapers, magazines, and newly developing the internet. And he recently been known for working in Nikki View on uh, DenverPost.com and he's actually relocating pretty soon here, newly married, and he's just a great guy, very intelligent. He's very volunteered in his time with the community and with the Asian, his Japanese American culture. And so, uh, without further ado, Shigeyasu Asakawa. He makes me sound so smart. That's a stereotype, man. I actually cheated on uh, all my math tests in my senior year in high school. Just thought I—I never even told my mom that. Um, well, thank you for having me, and uh, I, I uh, uh, hope I can uh, entertain and, and maybe inform and. Uh, what I will do, part of what I will do tonight is um, I'm going to read from this, uh, which is a book that I wrote. Um, came out a year and a half, a couple years ago. And uh, they have some over there, so please buy them. Um, uh, and uh, so I'll, I'll read a little bit from that. It's called Being Japanese American. And, and uh, obviously it's about my heritage and my kind of growing up um, as a Japanese American. Uh, but it's also about being Asian uh, in America, whether you're first generation, you know, or an immigrant Asian, uh, or you're a third or fourth generation. Um, I think there are a lot of things that kind of bridge our communities and um, that we share. And then for you non-Asians in the audience, hopefully there, you know, there'll be um, after you get to know certain things about the Asian community or Japanese Americans, hopefully you'll, you know, think, oh, well, that's why he's that way. I've had a lot of people come up to me and say that, well, now, now they know why I'm so weird, it's, you know, once they've read my book, so. Um, you know, one of the things about being Asian, that, that it's not, you know, it's not always a great thing. It's a, right, this now, right now, is a great time to be Asian because it's hip to be Asian. A lot of <laughs> Asian things are hip, like feng shui or sushi. Uh, I mean, is there anybody, I know there's no place in Ames that serves sushi, but is there anybody here who's never had sushi? Oh, well, you guys will do it pretty soon. I feel sure. Um, it's not that scary. Uh, but you know, it's it's been in really my lifetime, less than my lifetime, that sushi's become this thing that everybody kind of knows and has tried. When I was a kid in Denver, when we moved there, when I was in high school, uh, there were two places that served sushi. They were both Japanese restaurants, and when you we ate there for special things, our family, uh, the only people you see in there are you know Japanese people and Caucasians who were in the military and had sushi in Japan. And sometime in like the 1990s, really, uh, sushi became this, this mainstream thing. It was an amazing uh, kind of an evolution where all of a sudden you had, you know, little sushi things popping up all over the place, in, in, uh, even in Denver, which is slow to pick up on, on fads. So um, it's been, and that was kind of the start of the, the it's Asian, you know, hip to be Asian kind of period, I think, because to have something that, you know, my friends growing up, they go, you eat that stuff, you eat that raw fish, ew, you know, and all of a sudden it was not just acceptable, it was like a great thing to go out with a bunch of friends and have sushi. So that was right about when I stopped eating sushi, it just got too popular. And sushi restaurants were letting everybody in, it used to just be for like me and my friends. Um, but one of the other things about being Asian is, um, you know, it's a stereotype, but we're short. And on the flight from Chicago, we were on this puddle jumper, you know, plane, uh, United plane, and it's very small. It's actually really nice. It has leather seats and uh, more space than the bigger United planes. 
but it's actually it was small. It was not very high. And so there are these, um, there are like several really tall guys. Um, they happen to be Caucasian. Uh, and they were like this, walking down the aisle to get to their seats. And I was like, <laughs> so, you know, that's, um, it has some benefits um, sometimes when you are Asian. So um, I wrote some notes about things I wanted to discuss before I um, got into the, uh, um, the book. And then after I read from the book, there's going to be an interactive kind of a um, uh, portion where it's an exercise uh, in, uh, I hate to say it because it sounds scary, cultural diversity. But it's actually kind of a fun thing, and uh, it's interesting to see the things that we find similar uh, in each other and the things that, uh, that are different, that, uh, that can sometimes separate us uh, as cultures, as, as communities. So, um, but right now, because things that are Asian are hip, um, I have found that, that so much of kind of who I am is much more acceptable than it used to be. You know, when I was a kid, often I'd get the, uh, you know, why don't you go back where you came from? Or, you know, somebody would come up to me and just go, ching chong, ching chong. And um, it used to drive me nuts when that would happen. And y you might think that that doesn't ca possibly happen, you know, uh, anymore. But just a couple of months ago, Adam Carolla, who is, uh, um, you know, Howard Stern's replacement on syndicated radio did a spoof of the Asian, what is it called, the Asian, Asian American Awards, you know, during the awards season with the Grammys and the Oscars and all that, Emmys, um, there's an Asian American Award given in Hollywood where they pick out performances and, you know, musicians and actors and whatnot and give out awards. Well, Adam Carolla on his morning show, which is syndicated across the country, uh, started out talking like he had this, uh, you know, some, some clippings from, uh, audio clips from the awards ceremony. And he set it up and said, well, here, here's some of the stuff that they were giving out. <laughs> and it was like five minutes of somebody going, ching chong, ching chong, ching, ching chong, ching chong, ching. And Adam Carolla and his sidekick were just cracking up. And there's currently a, a movement afoot. And he's, you know, he's indicated by CBS. <coughs> So there's currently a move afoot in the Asian American community, um, especially in California, but nationwide, to um, get CBS to formally apologize. They've kind of said, oh, this was in bad taste. But the, you know, one of the things that happens when kind of um, offensive things happen is that you get a non-apology apology. You get the, oh, I'm sorry you were offended. I didn't mean to offend you. They never say, oh yeah, that was really stupid what I said. I'm sorry. They always say, I'm sorry you were offended. Like it's your fault that you were offended. And so far, that's all that CBS has done. And so, um, you know, and those kinds of things, unfortunately, keep reminding us that um, the stuff that I kind of went through as a, as a, as a kid uh, haven't gone away. And, uh, and uh, the dialogue about race in America tends to be mostly a black and white dialogue, and rightfully so. I mean, you know, the civil rights movement um, led to so many changes, and it was driven by the African American community. Um, but in those, the kind of the battles that were fought then, and the battles that are still being fought today, one of the unfortunate things, I think, is that um, Asian issues tend to be either disregarded or minimized or totally invisible. So things like this Adam Carolla, how many people in here knew that this has happened? Zero. It's because the mainstream press doesn't think it's important. Last year, about the same time, actually, that that Corolla thing happened, it was in February of last year, uh, Hot 100, a uh, radio station, uh, the top-rated R&B station 
in New York City had a spoof on their morning show where they, um, the morning show team produced this fake version of, uh, you know, We Are the World, the Michael Jackson song, where he, they, the singer talked about, it was about, uh, uh, about the uh, tsunami in, uh, in Asia. And the song was awful. It was making fun of, you know, children being washed away and, and uh, uh, mothers dying. And, uh, and it used the word chink in the song. And this is on the top rated station in New York City. How many people here heard about that? Okay, at least some of you heard about that. The, um, the news person on that morning show was uh, Hapa, which is the kind of the Hawaiian word for mixed race. Uh, and she was um, part Korean and part African American, and she quit after this whole thing happened. She didn't. There's actually a recording uh, of uh, of her arguing with the other morning show hosts about how inappropriate that song is, and they just jumped all over her case, and then she quit. Um, so we were just talking at dinner on uh, about where you know we all have no idea where she is, but I hope she's working. Um, but I think there is a, a sense that. The things that happen to Asians aren't that important or aren't that drastic. Um, speaking as a Japanese American, I can say that, you know, for a long time, um, the internment of Japanese Americans and everybody in this room has heard of internment. Yes, thank you. Uh, you, just, you know, you just never know. But as speaking as a Japanese American, I can I can honestly say that I've often felt weird talking about how bad internment is um, and in fact there was as over the decades been a discussion on yes I'm not sure what that oh, internment okay in the, the internment of Japanese Americans is during the World War II uh, the United States government basically locked up 120,000 Japanese Americans or people of Japanese descent um, half of whom were US citizens born in the US and um, more than half of those were actually still like under 10 years old. And entire families were uprooted um, and put into concentration camps. Uh, there were nine of them. They were all inland away from the whole, uh, California coast. And they were all in godforsaken places. And there are, there's you know, reason to believe that these places were chosen because the Japanese um, communities in California had taken desert land and made them very arable and profitable as produce growing farms. And so the government's you know, assumption was that they would do the same in Southeast Colorado and uh, in, uh, in Arizona and uh, you know, all these in Utah, um, Idaho. And uh, so these, these camps were there during the entire war and there were barbed wire fences around them and then guard towers with machine guns. And there are some people who say, well, those machine guns were there to protect the Japanese from people who try to hurt them from the outside, except that the guns were, you know, faced in. So um, anyway, it's, it was not a great chapter in American history. And if you look in like high school history texts, text, Generally, you'll find that like out of 60 pages about World War II, uh, and maybe out of that, maybe 25 are about the Pacific theater, you know, the war in the Pacific, um, one or two paragraphs will be about internment. And so it's just not, you know, it's not in the mainstream consciousness. Um, in the 1980s, there was a campaign, and 70s and 80s, waged to, um, to get the government to apologize and to um, make redress payments, and that was signed into law by President Reagan in 1988. And, uh, and he made a formal apology saying that um, internment was based on racial prejudice and fear. And it wasn't, um, you know, it, it, at the time, it was said that the Japanese Americans were you know, on the California coast and they were going to help the Japanese invade California. So, um, you know, and the reality is that during the war, not a single Japanese American was found guilty of espionage or sabotage at all. So, um, but you know that that argument continues today. There's a woman named Michelle Malkin who wrote a book that was published a year ago, year and a half ago, um, 
uh, in defense of internment. And she says that the Japanese Americans needed to be locked up in the 1940s. And she says that Muslims should be locked up today. So and amazingly, she's a Filipino American. So I, you know, I, um, so anyways, that's, uh, that's what internment's about. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that the Japanese American community feels you know, very deeply about. Grace down here was interned, and she speaks in schools all the time about her experience. Um, so, um, gosh, where was I going with this? <laughs> I forget. Um, yeah, I was talking about how Asians are all, you know, we have shared culture. Um, I was saying that speaking as a Japanese American, that, uh, oh, I was saying that I feel embarrassed sometimes uh, saying how bad internment was. And in fact, that there was, has been for a couple of decades, uh, discussion within the Japanese American community on whether we should even use the word concentration camps. Because, why? Because the concentration camps where you know, the Jews were killed um, is a lot worse when you look at the scale of human horror. Uh, and it is, you can't argue that. And at the same time, um, the reality is that these were concentration camps. And President Roosevelt called them concentration camps in memos that he wrote before the war. So um, I would say that, that uh, it was a very conscious decision on the, on the government's part. Um, and, that, and that these were, you know, in fact, concentration camps. No, they weren't death camps, but they were concentration camps. Families were uprooted, lost their homes, lost their families, lost their possessions, uh, and, and they were you know, told you have two weeks to get everything you want to take with you that you can carry, and were often put into um, temporary housing uh, in places like uh, racetracks, you know, uh, for months, like uh, you know, three or four or five months. Uh, where they slept in horse stalls that were just whitewashed before they showed up. Um, and, uh, and then they were sent to semi-permanent camps, these camps in, in uh, godforsaken places uh, in the country. So, um, but there's this feeling that what Japanese Americans went through wasn't bad enough, so we shouldn't be whining about it. Uh, and. And I have all my life kind of felt that. And so it's hard to get over the kind of the cultural um, part of being Asian, which is all about um, don't bring attention to yourself, you know, bite the bullet. There's a great Japanese word called gama. Is there, how many Japanese Americans or Japanese are in here? There's a, there's a great word called gama, which is like, you know, um, like when you're going to the dentist, and the drill hurts, your dad would yell at you, Gama, gambate, which is bite the bullet, stop your whining, take it, you know, accept. Um, but there's this, there's this cultural value um, where we want to hold it in and not complain, um, which is so deep that I remember lots of times when my family would go out to dinner and we'd have really lousy service. I'd want to say something, and my mom would say, no, 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 don't say anything, don't say anything, you know, don't complain, you know, don't bring attention to us. Um, and I, you know, I think that that's uh, one of the reasons that Asians tend to be invisible in our society, is that we have this deep down cultural um, inability to bring attention to your, ourselves. Um, I've gotten over it, obviously. Um, and I don't know, you know, I don't know what it takes, except that when you look at like TV news, very few Asians in TV news, and when you see them, they tend to be women. And um, more, more now, you see Vietnamese, a lot of Vietnamese and Koreans now on like CNN, which is a great thing. Hardly ever see Japanese Americans um, in California, maybe because there's so many Asians there that you feel more at home. Um, and yet, still, nationally, you see hardly ever uh, Asian men on TV news. You see very few Asians in the mainstream pop culture. Um, Asians love rap music. I have very few Asian rappers out there 
a very few Asian rock and rollers out there. Um, you know, there's a guy who played bass for Smashing Pumpkins, and uh, there are some rappers out there, but they're only known in the Asian community. They're not like broken out into the mainstream. Um, you know, Sandra O oh is like the big hero right now because she's famous. She's in Grey's Anatomy. She was, and she's um, she's avoiding being stereotyped because she played this really wild character on the movie Sideways, and then she played the um, kooky lesbian in Under the Tuscan Sun, and uh, and she's in Grey's Anatomy, and she's terrific. It's great to see her. Uh, and I wish there were ways to find, you know, to get more Asians uh, into the pop culture. Uh, what do you think of when you think of a the word Asian in movies? You think of martial arts. You think of Jet Li. You think of Jackie Chan. And you think of Bruce Lee. And, uh, and those are great because, you know, Bruce Lee in the 70s kicked off this whole martial arts thing. And martial arts is good for you. It's about discipline. It's about structure. It's about... You know, learning traditions and uh, and all that is good. You know, whether you're Asian or not Asian, and you're taking martial arts, that's a good thing. Uh, and at the same time, I think in some ways the explosion of martial arts has held down Asians in pop culture because that's what everybody wants from us. You know, they want us all to be, you know, crouching, crouching tiger, hidden dragon. So um, uh, I don't know. You know. I, and then the other thing is uh, when Asians do kind of bring some attention to themselves in movies, um, like speaking of Crouching Tiger, you know, Zhang Ziyi, uh, she's a terrific actress. You know, uh, I'm glad she does all the things she does. Um, House of Flying Daggers, all those are great, cool movies. Uh, how many people here saw Memoirs of a Geisha? Um, it bugged me. It bugged me that the three lead women were Chinese, and uh, you know, not not that I have anything against Chinese actresses, but these are well-known Chinese actresses speaking English with a Chinese accent, but that they're supposed to be Japanese. And for somebody who doesn't, you know, outside my community or, or your community, it, it, you may not register. And I, you know, I'm sure to Hollywood, you know, that that's what they were hoping for. Hollywood's, you know, reasoning was, well, we couldn't find Japanese actresses that could play these parts, um, and they, and, and you know, the reality is they couldn't find famous Japanese actresses, you know, that could play these parts. And uh, I'm glad these women got to these parts, but it bugged me that they were Chinese and they were playing Japanese. Um, it wouldn't bother me so much if they weren't like them, you know. They had whole conversations with all three of them in a scene where all I could hear was Chinese accent. Um, and what it told me is that to Hollywood, we all look alike, so it doesn't matter. That's really what it meant to me. You know, it's not about Chinese and Japanese, it's that, w what does it matter? You're all the same, aren't you? So, and the one other thing that I will say about pop culture and, um, and movies and Asians is um, Harold and Kumar. Um, what is it, Harold and Kumar going to White Castle? <laughs> That's a terrific movie. If you're over like 40, you probably don't want to see it because you'll get freaked out by the subject matter. <laughs> but it's about two young Asians, a Korean American and a South Asian, you know, Indian uh, American, who, who fit the stereotype to an extent. The, the you know, East Asian kid is, uh, I mean, the South Asian kid, the Indian, is um, st kind of studying to be a doctor. And the Korean American is an accountant. And, um, but they're slackers. They're, you know, total, it's about getting the munchies. <laughs> they're, they're, total, they're total guys, actually, is what they are. And uh, it was so refreshing to see Asians playing roles that are not Asian specific. You know, these could have been two white kids um, on a search to fill their munchies, you know, fulfill their munchies quest. Uh, but it wasn't. And, and it's just so refreshing to see Asian Americans portrayed as regular Americans. 
And that's, uh, you know, if you look at the history of African Americans in our pop culture, it really wasn't until the 1970s that um, blacks started being, you know, stars on TV shows. Until the 70s that the black movie industry, quote unquote, became mainstream so that it wasn't just meant for blacks. And it's because of those things that happened in the 1970s that Denzel Washington today can play a role that could be played by a white person, could be played by an Asian, could be played by anybody, but it's actually, he's playing it because he's Denzel Washington. They didn't make it a black role and hire him to play a black man. He just happens to be black and he's playing the role. Um, and so uh, I think in time, the you know, Asians will um, become more mainstream in our pop culture, but it's gonna take a bunch of us becoming kind of more obnoxious and you know, being less kind of inward and shy and not bringing attention to ourselves. Um, my mom always hated it when I started to bring attention to myself. Um, a friend and I have played on the Pearl Street Mall, it's an outdoor mall in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, since 1983, we've played guitar on the mall every summer. My mom was appalled when she found out that I was actually doing that and you know making racket in public uh, and bringing attention to myself that way. So she's always been very much against my doing this kind of stuff. She would, you know, if she were in the audience right now, after I was done, she would tell me, you talk too fast. I don't understand anything. Okay, mom, thanks. Thanks for the vote of confidence. So um, I want to read a little bit from my introduction from from the book because I, I you know because I have the podium and I could make you guys stay here and listen. Or you could leave, but hopefully you won't. So true story. <laughs> I was a banana. That's what I've been told by people who know, Japanese Americans who've been involved in community activism all their lives. Even though I was born in Japan, I haven't studied my roots in Japanese culture or even the history of Japanese Americans all my life. I didn't know who Vincent Chin was or about the No-No Boys. Because I didn't know about the history, I was told I was a banana, yellow on the outside, white on the inside. I'm going to take a quick side trip here. Who, who knows about Vincent Chin? Who knows about the No-No Boys? Okay, very quickly, I will explain that, the, that Vincent Chin was an auto worker in Detroit who was killed in the early 1980s, uh, beaten to death by a baseball bat by two guys, Caucasians, who had been laid off um, from the uh, Ford or GM, one of the auto companies. And as they were beating Vincent Chin to death, they were saying things like, go back home, you know, um, you took our jobs, you know, go back to Japan. And Vincent Chin, before he died, all he could say was, I'm not Japanese, I'm Chinese American. And um, so these guys beat him to death, thinking he was Japanese. Um, they got off, actually. Uh, they, they did not have to uh, you know, spend the rest of their life in prison or anything. That's Vincent Chin. The No-No Boys, uh, during internment in the 1940s, uh, two years into internment, the US government realized that they were going to need more men to go fight in the war. And that, uh, and there were frankly lots of Japanese Americans who wanted to fight when the war started, you know, against the Japanese or against you know, Hitler, uh, and they were not allowed to. When the war started, anybody who was in the army who was Japanese uh, American uh, was immediately kicked out. Uh, I think the designation is 4F, you know, un unservable or whatever the designation is, um, because they were no longer citizens, actually. And um, two years in, the U.S. government passed out questionnaires, uh, a loyalty questionnaire that asked a bunch of questions. And two of the questions were, and I'm paraphrasing here, um, do you forswear allegiance to the emperor of Japan? And would you serve in the U.S. military against any enemy of the state of the, uh, of the United States? That first question, of course, is like that, that joke about, you know, the question, do you still beat your wife? Uh, you know, you can't say yes or no because, you know, it means that you beat your wife. Um, so 
these two questions together, a, a, a fair number of Japanese Americans said no to both those questions. They were the no-no boys. A group of the no-no boys were actually tried for treason and spent, um, they were imprisoned in, uh, um, uh, not false prison, what's the other one? Anyway, they were in prison, in federal prison. Uh, and it wasn't until I think the 1950s that um, they were pardoned. Um, that, you know, that obviously they weren't um, being treasonous at all. They were uh, expressing their right, uh, First Amendment rights as Americans to be pissed off that your family got locked up in prison in internment camps and, uh, and your, you know, your government was asking you to fight uh, overseas to defend their right to imprison your family. So they were the no-no boys. And I, when I was young, until really like you know, 15 years ago, I didn't know anything about this. Um, nobody had taught me this stuff. And unless you go looking for it, or unless you're in a Japanese American family that, that talked about this stuff, which in itself was rare, you wouldn't know about it. So I was a banana, yellow on the outside, white on the inside. It's true that I grew up among Caucasian friends, especially after my family moved to the States. And I wasn't involved politically or socially with Asians or Asian causes. But I like to think of myself as more than just a fruit. I'm really a dessert. I'm a banana split with both my yellow and white sides sharing equal attention. I know more about Japan than some other Japanese Americans for one thing. Since I lived there as a kid, I have vivid memories of Japan, even though it's the Japan of 35 years ago before the first McDonald's or KFC showed up there. And I feel at home, sort of, when I visit Japan. I've also immersed myself in Japanese history and pop culture in recent years, and I feel I'm as much a Japanese as I am an American. My Japanese language skills are still pretty wretched, I'll admit, but that's not uncommon for Japanese Americans. My mother tried to teach my brother and me to read and write Japanese after our family moved to the States, but we refused. Instead, I learned every American obscenity I could and went around the summer of 1966 proudly enunciating some of the foulest language on earth, even though my eight-year-old mind had no idea what I said any, but I really most, most of those words meant. Uh, my idea of a cool four-letter word wasn't kana, which is the word for the Japanese uh, alphabet, and my vocabulary didn't include any Japanese alphabets. Still, I can understand a fair amount of Japanese, and if I say so myself, my accent on the few words I do know is pretty authentic. I pass, I mean I never pass for a Japanese in Japan, but I can surprise an employee in a Japanese restaurant by sounding first generation at least for a little bit when I'm not cursing loudly in English, that is. It's my appearance that's more American. Rumpled jeans, baggy clothes, loud colors, the loping way I walk as if I'm moving to the beat of rock music in my head. And I wrote this before I had my iPod, so now it's really that way. Uh, with my head up and making eye contact with others. And my taste, brightly painted car, loud music, colorful language. Um, since I didn't have Asian friends in grade school and high school, I eventually forgot that I was Asian. And I would imagine if you're Asian in a place like Iowa, maybe that happens. You know, you guys are fortunate in that you have a community that you've been raised within, so you have that. I didn't have Asian friends, Japanese friends or any Asian friends when, when my folks moved to the suburbs in Northern Virginia when we moved from Japan. Um, I thought of myself as white, and I hung around with my white friends and acted like any American kid, at least while I was away from home. I was only reminded of my different face and skin color, uh, why do they call it yellow anyway? I'm not yellow. When racism periodically raised its ugly head and confronted me. Even while I was attending art school, it didn't occur to me that I might be a banana, or any ethnic flavor for that matter. My work followed the paths of centuries of white Eurocentric artists from Leonardo da Vinci to Andy Warhol. I learned about Japanese art, including the woodcut prints that influenced the French Impressionists I loved, but I never felt that urge to make, you know, Japanese-inspired art. All my life, though, I was Japanese in all sorts of very visible ways, not the least of which my skin. That's the banana peel, I guess. 
I loved all kinds of Japanese food. I usually took off my shoes even in my friends' homes, always at home. I, my mom would just smack me upside the head if I walked in with my shoes on. Uh, and I was polite to seniors. I respected authority, sort of. And slowly, as I got older and began to feel the need to get involved in the community around me, I began to realize that the part of me that was the banana peel wanted to reach below the surface. I wanted to be around others who looked like me. Whether or not they were also bananas didn't matter. I became involved in the local Japanese and Asian Pacific Islander communities, joining nonprofit organizations and participating in Asian Pacific American events. These outlets helped me connect my internal and external selves and make sense of my self-image. Ultimately, the interaction with others has helped me accept my split personality and helped me <coughs> excuse me, feel comfortable in my own skin. Sure, there are millions of people who are more Japanese than me. Good for them. But I've also met JAs who are even more banana-like than me. People who can't speak any Japanese without fumbling over the syllables, who've never dined on Japanese food. Honestly, I met a guy in the 80s and the 90s who had never had Japanese food. He's Japanese-American, fourth generation. He never had Japanese food and had never had sushi, even though there's lots of sushi restaurants by then. He just refused because he just thought it sounded gross. Um, he loved Mexican food. And that's what he went, you know, then he, he moved to Texas, went to work for the Dallas Morning News, and I'm sure he has the best Mexican food ever. Good for him. Um, and people who mangle, yeah, I know a lot of Japanese people who mangle their own names, saying it American style. And uh, I've also uh, know people who've never had Asian friends and people who just have no clue that they have a wonderfully rich culture that's deeply rooted in their DNA. It's taken me a while, but I feel more aware of political issues and the pervasive racism that surrounds all people of color in our culture. I now know who Vincent Chin was and why the no-no boys deserve some respect. In a way, I am a born-again Japanese American. I'm aware of both sides of my culture, the inside and the outside of the banana. So um, that's just part of the introduction. Um, but that's kind of why I wrote it. Um, because I wanted to express this kind of dual personality that I've felt all my life without even knowing it. You know, even when I thought I was like a white kid, at home I wasn't, because I wouldn't take off my shoes. And the weird, stinky stuff that my mom made sometimes wasn't weird to me, because I grew up with it, you know? I would bring my friend Bubba and John home from school and if my mom was making like this, this stuff, this stew called oden, if my mom was making oden, I'd feel really embarrassed because you'd open the door and it's like, Whoo! who died? Um, you know, and I'd like to tell John and Bubba, you know what, uh, let's go to a Pizza Hut or something and hang out. Um, so there's always those moments, but inside the house, you know, I uh, hate to admit it, but when my mom said clean the room, I actually cleaned the room and, you know, I might flip her off from my bedroom, but but I do it. Uh, I do my homework. I, I get the straight A's, whether I cheated on the test or not. Now, actually, here's the deal. I cheated. I didn't cheat on the test. I cheated on the homework assignments, but when it came time for the test, you know, I, I didn't cheat and I get, you know, really good grades, so... I just figured I knew the stuff and I could cheat on the homework because I just thought it was a pain. Um, my passion was more in the art stuff and the English classes. So that's, you know, just wanted to explain that. Um, one other thing I want to read, and I don't know if this is something that happens to other Asian Americans or not, but most Japanese Americans I know have had some variation of this conversation. It starts out when you're introduced to somebody and they say, you speak such good English. Most Japanese Americans have probably heard this backhanded compliment and then suffered through a variation of this conversation. Really, your English is so good. What nationality are you? American. No, really, where are you from? California. Oh, you know what I mean. Where's your family from? California. 
Then the other person walks away thinking you're a jerk who's just being difficult. And in actuality, what's difficult is the inescapable feeling that you are not being taken seriously as an American. Not just as an American citizen, but as a person who's American. And I think that part, most Asian Americans, I think, are familiar with that feeling, unfortunately. Um, we are the other. We're the outsiders. You know, even in this discussion of race, we tend to like not be part of the discussion. You know, we're not at the table, um, having them part of the dialogue. So it's like we're on the outside looking in, and when people meet us, they just assume we're outsiders. Um, you know, the great thing about America as the quote unquote melting pot is that you have centuries of people from Europe mostly who have been the mainstream, who've been kind of like the, um, the, the power brokers, the man, the establishment. And if you're from, if you're European American, you know, it may take a generation, it may take a couple of generations, but you eventually become accepted as Americans. Mostly because you're white. You blend in. Um, you know, I think the Irish forget that in the 1880s, when they first, or 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, when they first started coming to the US, they were the most despised group. In fact, they were so despised that the only, if, if an Irish man died and uh, his widow, um, the only kind of person that the widow could marry, aside from another Irishman, would have been a Chinese man from California, you know, who, who uh, a minor, for instance. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, of records of um, Chinese immigrants, early Chinese immigrants who married either Irish women who were widowed or Mexican <coughs> women. And uh, it's an interesting thing to think about, the place of the Irish when they first started coming. When the Italians started immigrating to the US, they were spit on, they were like the lowest class Americans and when Joe DiMaggio, the great baseball player, started playing in the late 1930s, he'd come out of the dugout and the fans would spit on him because he was Italian. That's like the only, that's the only reason because he was Italian. And uh, you know, now look, you know, Tony Soprano is God. Um, and Asians don't have that ability to blend in. Um, and neither do African Americans. That's kind of a different story. Um, African Americans kind of, you know, have earned the right to be at that dialogue, at the table, having the dialogue uh, because of the, um, the civil rights movement. There never really was a civil rights movement for Asians. There was a brief flurry of activity in the late 60s and early 70s that forced universities to recognize Asian America and begin Asian American history courses. Um, but that was it, and a lot of like the people who fought for that stuff are still active in the community, and um, you know they're baby boomers, and uh, and it's almost like that's what they did, and it just never really progressed beyond that. So um, I've always found it interesting that Asians uh, in America have this um, strange place where we're very popular if it's about Asian things, but not so much Asian people. It's a weird thing. Um, Asian food is really hip, you know. Sandra Oh, I'm gonna go back to her, because I think she's, um, she, she might end up being kind of this nexus, this, 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 this person that can actually almost, I don't wanna put it all on her, but you know, her appearance in that TV show uh, and in movies or whatever, normalizes Asian Americans um, for the rest of America. And I just am really looking forward to seeing um, how things develop from here. If more people go into acting and uh, get bigger roles and whatnot. And that, that's what it'll take for us to become mainstream. Margaret Cho's TV show in the 90s was kind of a, an experiment that went wrong. And, um, and she paid the price for it. Um, it'll take more shows like that, you know, before there'll be like an Asian version of the Cosby show 
Um, before the Cosby Show, there were a handful of TV shows um, featuring African Americans, you know. So uh, I think it'll just take more time, and I, I, I feel like it's going to happen. But it's going to take people, you know, like some of you in here, young Asian Americans, to go into fields that are high visibility. Don't do what your parents say. Don't become doctors. Don't become engineers. You know, honestly. Um, do something crazy and weird. Piss your parents off. They'll understand. They'll eventually calm down. Um, what I want to do is, um, a, a, and I'll, I'll make this maybe a short, but I want to try a little exercise in contextual differences, which is kind of a hoity-toity way to, of saying um, cultural diversity. Uh, I am going to make a series of statements, and I want you to stand up if you fit the statement. Um, it's a silent exercise, and um, the exercise will involve some self-disclosure. So if you are uncomfortable, um, don't want to reveal anything, don't stand up. You don't have to. It's just uh, it's kind of an interesting thing, and it's just important that you take care of yourself. So. Stand up if you're bilingual. And you don't have to be like, you know, fluent if you're bilingual. Okay. Now notice who's with you. Notice notice who's not. Notice how you feel. And sit down. Stand up if you think women should make less money than men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're being the rebels now. Stand up if you've been to Asia. Again, notice who's with you, notice who's not, and notice how you feel. You know, do you feel proud? Do you feel embarrassed? Do you like? Do you go? Oh wow, I didn't know she'd gone to wherever. Um, and then please sit down. <laughs> Stand up if you were not born in the U.S. <coughs> Notice who's with you. Notice who's not. Notice how you feel. You can sit. Thank you. Stand up if you're of mixed ethnicity. Notice who's with you, notice who's not, and notice how you feel. And again, you know, take care of yourself. If you feel uncomfortable, don't stand up. Stand up if you've been discriminated against because of your skin color. Please sit. Stand up if you've been discriminated against because of your age. Including if you're too young and your parents don't take you seriously. <laughs> okay, please sit. Stand up if you've been discriminated against because of your gender. Dudes. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm not. I'm not here to question or judge. <laughs> okay. No. no, it's all right. No, I didn't mean to. I totally am not here to judge. Stand up if you've been discriminated against because of your sexual orientation. Stand up if you've been discriminated against because of a disability. Stand up if you've ever broken the law. <laughs> See, Asians aren't supposed to stand up at this part. <laughs> this is interesting. Okay, man, we, you know, look who's with you. Notice who's not. Stand up if you've ever illegally downloaded music files for free. <laughs> uh, you bad college students. <laughs> 
stand up if you've ever burned a CD or a DVD. You might as well just stay standing for a while. Right? <laughs> okay, thank you. Stand up if you've ever peed in the pool. <laughs> This is where you start to learn the harsh realities of life. Okay, you'll... <laughs> Stand up if you wear glasses or contacts. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we're Asians, so we're supposed to. I've had glasses since third grade. Um, six years ago, I got LASIK, and it was like a miracle to be able to see the alarm clock in the morning, you know, three feet away was a miracle. And these are like um, bifocals because now I'm an old fart and I need them. But they told me when I got LASIK that I would, in about five years, I'd need um, bifocals or reading glasses. Stand up if you feel you don't quite fit in. Notice who's with you, notice who's not. Notice how you feel. You can sit, thank you. Stand up if you're good in math. I thought you were gonna, you thought I was gonna say good in something else, huh? Good in math, thank you. Stand up if you love rap and hip hop music. Asians and hip hop, I, you know, I had this conversation, but Asians love hip hop, it's interesting. Um, stand up if you love country music. Right on. I'm a big fan of all kinds of music. Um, there's crappy music of all types. Stand up if you know someone who's HIV positive. Thank you. Stand up if you think your parents are overprotective. <laughs> Stand up if you are an overprotective parent. <laughs> no, 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 just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, stand up if your parents save and reuse margarine tubs, Cool Whip tubs, plastic bags, and even disposable Tupperware. Thank you. Stand up if you have a parent or parents with an accent. Look who's with you. Notice how you feel. Uh, stand up if you take your shoes off at home. See, it's not really a Japanese thing anymore, is it? Um, stand up if you can perform a traditional dance or song. Traditional in, in an ethnic sense. Or, I guess, clog dancing. If, you know, Appalachian clog dancing. You're in a clogging group. <laughs> Damn, there you go, see? That's good. That's, uh, you're like upending even my expectations. Stand up if you've had rice in the past week. <laughs> you three are honorary Asians. <laughs> you stood up for every Asian thing over here. Good for you. Um, stand up if you've had rice in the past three days. See, growing up, my mom, we had rice every day of my life I, that I can think. I don't think, she would make, you know, like the boxed mashed potatoes, but she'd also make rice. You know, we would have rice. We'd have, she'd make spaghetti, and we'd have rice. It's just, was, you know, part of what we ate. I, it's a weird thing. Um, <laughs> You know, that's probably why I'm so fat now. Too many carbs. Um, stand up if you have more Asian friends than non-Asian friends. You guys need to hang with some different people. <laughs> um, stand up if your name has been mangled in the past. 
you guys totally are Asian. Can I ask what, it, what one of your names is? Heather Haugen. Haugen? How do you spell that? H-A-U-G-E-N. Okay, it's like a German. You have German, German. Norwegian. And so people look at that and go, is that H- Hugen? H- Hugen? Um, Hagen. Hagen? Hagen, yeah. Uh, I, you know, Asakawa, I would think would be easy. Japanese names are really kind of easy. They're, they're um, phonetic, you know, and... Um, but all my life, I've heard Askawawa, <laughs> Askakawa, Asakawa. It's so irritating. Asakawa. I mean, how hard is that? I, you know, I actually, I, I got around to saying, if people look like they're gonna like not have a problem with saying my name, I'll say it's like Kawasaki sideways, and they they know Kawasaki, so they go, oh, okay, well that's easy. So I got 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 around to giving people a hint so they can do it right. Um, stand up if you can understand more Japanese, Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, etc., Hmong, Laotian, Thailand, than you can speak. Stand up if you understand more than you can speak. What language? My dad speaks Mandarin. Mandarin. See, that would be, that's a tough one. So you understand, but you can speak a little bit? I've gotten to the point where I can tell the difference, you know, if I, I mean, I'm sure to a Chinese person it's very obvious right away. I, I can, you know, I can tell the difference now in the kinds of, of, of um, syllables and the um, sounds um, between Mandarin and Cantonese. But, you know, to most Americans, it's all, you know, I grew up with people doing that in my face. Like, oh God, that is so old, man. Um, stand up if you cuss a lot and like it. <laughs> right on. I'm being really good. I usually cuss a lot when I speak. Stand up if you know what you be, want to be in 10 years. Well, good for you. Good for you. Uh, my wish is that you're, you're true to your, your vision and that your life you know, works out the way um, you wish it to. I have to say my life is totally not like what I thought it would be. I went to art school thinking I was going to go work for Marvel Comics and I just got sidetracked. <laughs> um, so, um, I want to, you to take a few moments to reflect on the exercise. It's, I mean, it's a goofy exercise, but it also I think it's an interesting one for people. Um, you notice the places where you felt uncomfortable or you made assumptions about others or were surprised at the assumptions you had about others. Um, you know, notice if you felt embarrassed. Um, think about what you gained from the exercise and what you might be taking away from it. And uh, I want to thank you all for speaking up and standing up, I guess, um, and uh, I hope that there were some surprises for you, because it's the surprises that keep us kind of nimble and keep us open to um, all the great diversity that's out there in life. Um, the university setting is a wonderful setting, because you can experience this kind of stuff uh, in a safe environment, or what should be a safe environment, I should say. Universities are not always safe environments. But, you know, um, so please take advantage of it now. Join groups and stretch your brain muscles, you know, and try things and learn things and um, light yourself on fire. Do the things that you're passionate about now because you may not have a chance to do it later when you're busy dealing with life and job and work and family. So, um, you know, the goal is to do the stuff that you love and get paid for it. And if you can do that, you're really living good. And I feel like I've been allowed to do the stuff that I love and get paid for it. And so I, uh, I feel super fortunate, you know. I, I love doing the internet stuff that I do for my job. I love you know, writing things like being Japanese American and getting to talk to groups like you. So thank you very much for having me. And, um, you know, thank you 
to you guys for sponsoring this and bringing me in, and to Alex especially for um, carting me around. Um, he's my Cato this, <laughs> this week. <laughs> so you're my Bruce Lee, man. Um, so I'll be the Green Hornet, and thank you very much. And um, uh, I'll, I'll be happy to, if you all want to buy some books, um, I'll be happy to sign them for you. So uh, I'll, I'll stick around if you want to ha have a question. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. Does anybody have any questions? I mean to shut you down. Yes, ma'am. Have you read Snow Falling on Cedars? I did read Snow Falling on Cedars. I thought the book was more fun to read than the movie was fun to watch. But I actually like the movie. I've watched it a few times. And it, it does a good job of kind of telling some of the heartbreak that went with internment. Even though it wasn't about internment, it was about like the years after internment and the racism, that, that, the, the hatred and stuff that people still felt in the in northwest uh, part of the country. Um, but it was a beautifully done film. I, I like looking at it. So yeah. Um, I would much prefer watching that over and over again instead of, of uh, Memoirs of a Geisha. So, uh, the, you know, by the way, the other movie that I do like, even though it's kind of historically incorrect, is Last Samurai with Tom Cruise. Uh, it actually tells, in a fic broadly fictionalized way, it tells a lot about the values of Japan, Meiji era Japan in the 1800s, and, and kind of the, the disruption it made to Japan to suddenly become modern and become westernized. So it's a really, it's an interesting movie. Uh, the only part that's totally bogus is that uh, somebody like Tom Cruise could go there, live in a mountain village for one winter, and learn to speak perfect Japanese and learn the, you know, to be a perfect samurai in four months. That, that was a little bit of a stretch. But it's a cool movie nonetheless. Uh, any other questions? Where in Japan were you born? I was born in Tokyo. I was born, my dad was in the U.S. military during the Korean War, met my mom. Uh, she was, she's from Hokkaido, the northernmost island. And my dad was born and raised in Hawaii. Um, and um, I was born in the U.S. Army Hospital in Tokyo, in the geographic center of Tokyo, which is now a world-famous cancer hospital. So, um, yeah, that's where I was born. My brothers and I were all born there, actually. So, um, any more questions? Okay, you're free to go. <laughs> Thank you. Are the books on sale? No, like for sale. I mean, not, not for sale, but like on a discount. Hey, I'm trying. I'm help. I'm trying to help you out. Okay. No. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>